So, so um, basically, a problem in in I guess all machine learning <coughs> is can be illustrated by this picture here. You you, you can think about two different kernels. Somehow you will separate one. So you have the you will separate the blue from the green, blue from the red ones. You can either have this black line here. That's a pretty good job, but it does some mistakes here and there. Or you can have the green line. But that's a perfect job. But which one do you think will be best for something new? Do you think the blue black line or the green line will be best? My base, most likely the black line is better because it's more better than generalized. I mean, you don't know, but so. But how 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 would we then? So, so somehow we, it's kind of intuitive that we think that this this green line is kind of trained too much. We can, as I said, we can always make a computer program to recognize everything we see. I mean, it's just to have a list of this should be this group and this should be group. So you just have a list of it. And if you have enough variables, like we have here, we have a lot of variables for this problem here, we can train it to learn exactly what we want to do. But it might not be very good at generalizing. So say they want to have something like this, but we don't. You want to have 0 0.5 or 0 0.2 to be one group and another one, and not, not only 0 and 1, but real, real numbers. Maybe to have too many variables is not a good idea. And how do we know if we do that? So one, one way to do it, at least in, 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 uh, in the biology, is what we call... Uh, uh, and often what you do is what you, want, what you have is you have like Test set and a training set. So we want to have a, a training set uh, that is different from the test set. But it's not enough that it's not a different set. You also have to be no obvious relationship with it. So we just take the same things, but we just I mean, take copies of the same things in the training set and put in the test set. It won't do any good. Uh, And in principle, uh, so we want to, we must, we want to have a set that is the same, same type of data, but it's completely unrelated to it. And this is often called, we call it, we often call it homology reduction. So, in, in biology, we don't want to have two proteins. If we recognize a pattern, we want, don't want to have two proteins that are homologous in the same data set. So that's kind of what we. That we, that we just detect homology, basically, and not, not the feature we want to look at. And in principle, actually, we probably want to have a third set also. So we want to have three levels. So if you want to, have, if you want to optimize the number of layers, then that just ideally you should do that in a separate set again. But that's often not done. So this is sometimes a bit of a problem, because of course, a training set needs to be big also. And uh, kind of generally include everything in it. So it should be large enough, at least, to... Certainly, that's not a problem for cats or internet. You have a big set of cats on internet, and you can probably try to separate ones that are too similar in some clustering first, and then, just, then take them. But it also should be a little bit unbiased. So, for instance, we don't want to have um, just one type of pictures. And, not, and anyway, not too identical to the test set. So, in short, the training set should be representative, but also the test set should be representative, but it should be unrelated. So a, a classical example was done in image recognition, I think it was the American Army. So they wanted to take, take pictures, and they wanted to recognize the pictures that had a tank, so a military tank on them, once they did not have it. So they did, uh, so they tried to identify these guys lines, and it was a long time ago, so it was not, I think, bad advanced, but you tried to recognize this. And you trained it, it was perfect. You got it right every time. And you had a training set and test set, you just divided your pictures into like training and testing. And then they went out to take an independent set, so they went out to take new pictures and do it again. Didn't work at all. And then they realized that all the pictures with the tanks were taken on a sunny day, and all the pictures with other tanks were taken, take, take, taken on a cloudy day. So we had a very good separation of sunny and cloudy days. But so there are things you don't think about really in the very constant sense. There, there are examples, many examples in biology where the same thing happens. You, you try to separate training test sets, but actually 
you have things that are related in the training and test sets, so actually you are just learning to recognize the evidence in the training set. So that's we talk more about, more about later. Often you even have you want to have new data, things that you haven't seen before. You have the blind test. You can't even know the answer before it's to really validate the things. But that's another story. But in principle, what you have is you want to have a training set and a test set. And for a neural networks, you often want to know where you want training. Often you look things look like 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 a bit like this. So if you have your error here, so some measure of the error. So this is the average error per protein. So here you have 25% wrong, and here 20 percent wrong. And the red curve is the training set. So in the beginning, you start with this is, this is the number iteration, the number if you remember you train them train the cycle of neural networks, we update all the weights and then um, for each individual example and then we update it again. So you do that and in the beginning it goes from very high error to very short error very quickly. And then on the training set it keeps on going down, better and better and better and better. But in your test set it doesn't keep on going down. So often you want to stop somewhere much early. And yes. Is the um, is the error rate lower in the training set because of this overfitting or what's the Yes, basically yes. Yeah. Right. You basically so ideally of course we have perfect sets, you should never I mean it's you would faster. You will always recognize things better days. It's always gonna be like that. But but the important is how you me that you measure performance on test sets. Of course if this one will start lower it's not that bad if this one is still decreasing. But in this case, it seems to be honestly to be to 50 iterations or 200 doesn't really matter, or 300, 400, but it, it probably was over here. I would probably stop somewhere 100 or something like that. But and the observations in the training set uh, independent from each other? Uh, ideally, they should be, yes. So uh, often what you do is that you try to have one representative example, but you never know that. Really. I mean, because. I wasn't expecting the error in the training set to always go down because so when you are seeing observation number 500 is different from all the 499 you've seen before. Mm, so it doesn't have, I mean, somewhere you, sometimes you stop often. But of course, I mean, this is assuming you have enough uh, parameters there, you can, you can basically get it to recognize everything. You can basically get it, get it up to zero. It's just, I mean, you can basically learn, memorize everything there if you have enough parameters. So it, so it depends on the number of uh, parameters you have. But often in our last books, you have, quite, you have quite a lot of parameters. You have to have like much more parameters than, than other than training data. So, <coughs> so it's, in principle, you could recognize everything. In principle, you should be able to get the best under zero. I mean, you won't, but, but so in theory, yes. So one set, one problem was you don't have is sometimes you don't have enough training and, and test data. So one the, the way to do this is to use cross validation to have to use more data. So you basically maybe have three cross relations. You do training on two, th two thirds of the set and testing one third, and you do then on the other two thirds, and you so basically have more. Data. You, you tenfold. Or you can actually even do what's called jackknife, which you take out one example, train all the other examples, and test on this one. It all depends on how much data you have compared to how much computer time you want to spend on it. But ideally, you want to. Uh, and then of course the problem is there. I mean, ideally, that's, that's the only way to really measure performance. To, Train it on one set of data and test another set. Could it also happen that if you have an n dimensional problem after training, you realize that you actually don't need this many dimensions? Mm, yes, I mean, it's often what you notice here if you do this for different types of uh, I mean, complexes, but basically, dimensions, more complex networks, you make more dimensions. So, of course, it's not obvious that the most complex one it has better performance than the test set. Often, it's better to have a more simpler representation. So that this is one parameter you often try. Like so, I mean, it's not. So it's often that you sure you can get this one to find fast, but this one is so higher. So this, it's certainly that is not. Uh, and that's kind of common. For me. So once you have this, you need some kind of metrics. You need to tell when something is good and when something is bad. And principally, you can look at your data like this. So this is if this is your positive examples and your negative examples. So you have a distribution. Got the curve here. So you, your output would be some kind of score between zero and one or between something. And you will have yes, 
just some number of examples and you have a score here. Assume that it's good to have a good high score. The positive examples will be looked at that. And your negative examples looks maybe like that. So you have a good separation. But you also have to define some kind of cutoff, say this is positive one, this is negative one. And then assume that it's not perfect, you have what you call the true positive one, which is basically all the ones over here. These are the true positive ones. The false positive ones, which are basically ones that are wrong, but are over cut off, so this one here. And the false positive ones. And this will be the false negative ones, the ones that are, should be positive but are, are negative, and the true negative ones. So then you can measure performance as, uh, well, you can measure the number of correct classified proteins, that's for example, so you guys take that one, not that one, the fraction of everything. So like if also if that's high, it's good. But it's always sometimes a problem also if these sets are not balanced. And maybe you have, if you want to do um, uh, identification with some rare factor, so, so n the negative ones are 99% of the data and the positive is 91%. So if you predict everything to be negative, you get 99% correct. So it's not, not such a good measure. Uh, so there has been a number of other curves that are measured, and for instance, one good measure is often called, called the matrix correlation coefficient. This is the formula here, so you take the number of correct ones, two plus two negative plus minus number of wrong ones, and divide by the sum of this. So the good thing with this is basically, it, it's, a, it, it's always in the range between zero and one, minus one and plus one. So zero should be completely random, and plus one is perfect, minus one is completely imperfect. In case you have then you have to turn the numbers around, you get the perfect. Uh, but uh, and it's sort of independent on if you have one percent or nine or ninety nine percent or fifty percent of positive examples in, in the, of the whole, the whole data set. It's not exactly the same numbers always, but but it, at least it's, it takes that into account. And otherwise, you have measures like uh, precision and recall. It's basically precision is number of, uh, uh, or accuracy is another word. It's basically how many of the true positive ones are correct. Or you have the recall, which is sens sensitivity. How many of the true positive ones you find? True positive rate is uh, how many of them should you find? So, there are different, this, this is so basically, but some way, one way to describe this is actually like a rock curve, so you receive operator characteristic curve. So basically, you have sort all your data. Here and then you present how much, well, in this case, it was true positive rate, you could present something else also. So, a perfect prediction would be basically all the positive ones here and all the four negative ones here. So, this is the correct predictions and this is the incorrect predictions, and the most flexible prediction you find. And a line here will be incorrect. So, you, you can see that, for instance, at the high position, maybe you have one method is better, but at the low one is not the one better. So, you can measure. You can really see my, my more detail how different predictors work. Because sometimes you're in, more interested in making very few mistakes, and sometimes you're interested in finding everything. So it's a little bit different on what question you're looking for. So we need to have this, this kind of measures, and often this MCC, I think, is a good measure to measure uh, performance if you also want to have one number. Uh, but other people have the rock curves, because the area of the MBS curves also match the videos. Okay, so now we have some methods to learn things. So how do we do this in protests? One problem is, of course, if you think about narrow network, is that we have amino acids are 20. So how do we represent an amino acid as a, into a narrow network or a super machine? So say I want, I want to recognize a sequence pattern. And I have a number of input nodes here, and I want to recognize something like that. So what I, I could, of course, encode all my amino acids as, as a number 1 to 20, something like that, or as an ASCII code, whatever. But you know, the, the output of this network is just the input here times some weight. <coughs> so if I, if I would encode my amino acid numbers as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Whatever I mean, as it happens, happens to five, it gets t five times better, higher input than the one I has a one. And that is quite unlikely that this is really what I want. So often what you do is that you need to 
use several input nodes for a single amino acid or single nucleotide. The simplest way is to do it as 20 input nodes. So if you have amino acid S, for instance, you have an an S there, you have a 1 here and a 0 in all others. And if you have another mean there, as here, maybe you have T is over here, so maybe you have 1 here and all others. So basically, you have 20 inputs now numbers for a single amino acid. So this is what's called sparse encoding. So I could, so here, for, for, for a certain position, I have a C is 1 and all others are 0. So that means that even for input of only a few amino acid sequences, like I have MASL, something shifts here, I need 80 numbers. So as you can see, it's quite easy that I get a lot, lot of variables. But there are some other ways to do it also. And one way to do it is to use uh, some kind of physical chemical description. You can, for instance, take one number, that's the side chain volume, so how big is it? This factor you can make volume that equal size could be good to have. Uh, you can have a hydrophobicity, you can have a charge rest state. So if you have three numbers, it can be, there are some other representative of the feature amino acids, then you'll have three numbers, but they're maybe not just zero and one. In experience, often you, you can tune things to use this one, but this is a kind of, and it's not a bad approximation to use this 20 representation like that. But it's not, uh, mm. in our case, maybe other things better. So you often have to try different things. So the next question is, now I want to recognize something in a sequence. So how do I, do I maybe, if, if my proofs are, say, say I want to recognize all Tut all thin uh, protein <coughs> proteases as well at the beginning. So they all have this kind of pattern that was discussed. But there are different lengths for the sequences and there are different, a lot of the things are different. For if I have them aligned, maybe it's easy, but if I don't have them aligned, how do I do it? So, one option is to use a sliding window. So basically, I have my amino acid sequence. Uh, represented, so I have like sequence here. And I say I want to recognize this pattern here, and, and then I have something else later. And I have another sequence also that starts with something similar. And then I said the one my target function is one here and zero for everything else. Another problem pro pro maybe have something here, and then I have something similar sequence here. Uh, the, this one also will have ones here, the zeros, and all other positions. So I basically have an input number that is one or zero for each amino acid in a sequence, and then I look for a window of, of residues and ask if the center of the residue there it should be a zero as well. That's one solution that is quite commonly used. Of course, for a secondary structure, this is perfect. So I say if this is a helix, I have one zero, and if this is something else, put zero, and I ask if this is a helix, then I have it. This is what we saw in the membrane correcting vector, right? Mm, like yes. Yeah, basically, the, the, in, the, in the memory is a bit special because basically you have some rules that you cannot, I mean, you have this has to be basically you can't jump from there to there without going into the map. So there's a grammar that you can also so most of them are using you can use this, but they also use some, some hidden marker model or something for the grammar rule. But basically yes. So, but but in the first thing I think Gunnar showed was this. There was yeah he showed some plot that was just uh, basically a sequence here and there was some numbers that were up like that. And this is basically also this was a had a phobic value, so basically take a windows here and you look at average in this, in this, re, in this, this region. But in this case, you would just <coughs> put the amino acid sequences in sparse coding or other coding. But if you just input them in health visitors on the value, that would be good. There are methods that, do, that use sequence also, so there are different methods to do it. So basically, 
you will end up with something like that. You have a sequence here. The first window will be M A S L V L V, and you will you, you will train it to predict just your L, and the next will be V and L, etc. So you will go through the whole sequence of that. So the first window will be that that, and you sh then you should change this to be C and L. So I will show you an example which is actually related to section Gunnar's example. Well, it's not his, it's his ex student who did that. So it's in subcellular sorting. So this is a method called uh, target P that predicts the subcellular utilization of proteins based on the amino acid sequence. So you can either be <coughs> basically can be ER or secretory, so basically using a single peptide go to the, to the Golgi and ER out. Mitochondrial, chloroplast, or something else. And there, are, there are more parts in the sub in the cell, but this is the methods that they used. Um, so I think Gunnar was talking about this. this. This is basically a cell here, and you have some sorting signals, and that tells you if you should go there and there and there. Of course, chloroplast only exists in plants, of course, so the you know, easy problem for humans. And the key here is that you have an N terminal pre sequence. So they, this. this Sorting is basically based on you have a single peptide or a mitochondrial target peptide or chloroplast target peptide. That is this part over here. That is all rather similar but not identical. And I think Gunnar talked a bit about that they had different lengths. And sometimes you can go to two different sides and you can train on different sides. So they are not that trivial to, to separate. And uh, then, of course, if you don't have any of these signals, you should end up somewhere else. So, and a rough approximation of what they look like uh, is like this. So the signal pattern is a bit shorter than the other ones, because it's longer. And here you have some pattern of uh, alanine and cysteine and isoleucine. Here you have an R minus 10, R minus 3. So you have a number of arginines that are 2 to 3 residues before the end of this one. And here you have some alanine pattern, something like that. So they are slightly different. And the first thing you can do is make you take your database, so you go through the literature, and uh, nowadays I think most people are fixed Swiss plot, and basically take Swiss plot and look at whatever is annotated there. It's Swiss plot is not perfect. It's most likely um, if you really go through it probably ninety five percent correct everything because it's always mistakes is something annotated. People didn't understand experiments really correctly. But you can anyway you can anyway do it and it's pretty good and uh, the first thing you can do is a logo. So these are the three logos. And uh, but just by visual impression you see that this is, has much higher signals than the other ones. The signal pattern has like one bit and even two and a half bits here, but the other ones has basically 0.5 and 1 bits of information. So they, clearly this seems to make a much easier group to predict than others. And these are, if you can also see, these are uh, Aligned so that these cleavage sites, so the sites where no where it's going to be cleaved, is, uh, is in the same position. And you see here you have an L in here. Here you can see this mitochondria that has these R minus 2, R minus 3, R minus 10 rows. You have like here two positions before this cleavage, you have two lot of arginines, and 10 positions before that you have another set of arginines. I think it actually is, I think if I heard, remember correctly. The reason why actually there should only be one origin here. There should only be minus only minus three, I think, or minus two actually. But it's that in some cases, in biology, is an extra step to click one extra amino acid. So the, the pattern that the, the answer that is recognizing it is actually cleaving to always at R minus two. But then in some cases, there is an additional answer that afterwards cleaves one more. I mean, that's you. So if you annotate it like that, that's why you have, this is spread out. This also makes this signal much weaker. If you would have aligned it in the cleavage pattern way, you probably would have a much stronger signal. Make a better predictor. But this is what you didn't, this, when this method was done, this was not known, and it's not, so you have to take what you have in the database. And here you have a valine, alanine, alanine signal. That is also something. But you see, you have, you see here is a lot of black things, hydrophobic things. Here is more mix, and here there is maybe more or green things, which I guess is like polar residues. So, 
Yeah, so signals, they're not perfect, they're not super weak, strong, but there's some signals you should, and, and they're different, so you should be able to separate them somehow. So the first step, you is actually, in this case, you extract the signals from Swiss plot, and then you go through literature, and you remove sequences that are too similar. And so the, the key, the one key thing is like, of course, if you, if you have um, a lot of data, uh, if you have the same signal sequence from uh, 50 different G strings, they're more identical. They are n not going to be very good for uh, making a predictive predictor. They are gonna, you can easily recognize them. So what you do is basically you look for sequence similarity between all your sequences and the ones that are too similar. Basically, the ones are homologous, you take away. So you started here with 109,607 entries, today it's much more, it's more than uh, uh, 800,000 of that. And you have, uh, um, in annotation here, feature transit peptide 1 to 55 is an accord blast. So you can look for these keywords here, and then you have the sequence, you know what, position 55, or here's our inscript. So you can just make a small computer program to extract all this information. And then actually, in this case, you also check the literature. You, actually, you look at the reference you have here, that is these references here, and make sure that actually what is in the database is, is agree with the experiments. This is what can't be perfect, but at least you can spend, in this case, you didn't have so much data, so you can, you can at least spend half an hour to look at it, and to read it, make sure that you, think you believe in it. And actually, did here, you remove the similar sequences, you run, have alignments with Waterman. You did some statistics. This was before blast. You count the neighbors with protein, and you remove puts uh, that are too similar. And until you have no nothing that is too, they only have one example of every similarity cut off. And no, normally have like 20% identity or something used there. So you do this homology reduction, and you end up with <coughs> data set like that. So this is not. Why? A reasonable size data set. But it's, because it's, not, it's not very big compared to the number of casts on YouTube. Mm. But you have uh, a few thousand proteins that are annotated where they are. And you have most of them at least in non plants that are in others. So they're not a, And you have a lot in the And you have fewest in the plants. This is what's before reduction and this is after reduction. So you maybe get rid read of like two thirds with the reduction. So at the end, you'll have 141 protein in uh, plants that are in chloroplasts, and 162 that are in uh, somewhere else. But in the other UK, you have more. So the rough idea is basically you should do that, that you do this prediction three, la three, three layers, or two layers, but three. First, you, then you first do actually individual predictions for chloroplasts, mitochondria, and single peptides. So these are trained independent, independent of everything else. And then you take the output of these networks and use that to predict uh, another network that tells you if you are going to be, which one is correct. And these ones are trained basically on just recognizing the probability basically that each position, each residue in the in a sequence is belongs to chloroplasta tells with pattern. So you have exactly here, you have something here, and if it was annotated in Swiss prot that this is a chloroplast sequence you have once in the case of chloroplast sequences and everything else is zeros. And then but then it's only until the cleavage size, so not nothing further away. So you have some uh, so basically you have three three networks that train like this. There is in the signal peptide, there's a special other program that is the signal peptide predictor. What, what, what have, there's also train in addition, you have to have a train that it has a secret that is a signal peptide, but also have a, another network that is trained on recognizing the cleavage site, specifically the site that it cleaves. Because you remember that we had a very strong signal on this element here, so this is quite easy to recognize. And you could do the other ones, but the signals is weaker. So you, you could think about it, and then, then in this case, they have an integrated network that takes the two inputs together and integrate them. 
But in this case, you could make just basically you have a prediction, and the basically you have, then then you do there's, there's, there's one number for each rest number. So basically, first layer is you take the first hundred residues or so, and you run these three different predictions separately. So you see, in this case, you have high number scores here for all the way until uh, recipe 40 with, with the chloroplast such a peptide quite low numbers a bit higher here in the middle of single peptide and quite low number a bit higher here in the beginning of the rest of the numbers so then you take these 100 numbers all these three together 3 times 100 numbers and put it into the net second, second network that is kind of the integrated network and that, that, puts, that trains them all together So, in this case, you could have a prediction that is actually uh, from and sequences. You will get end up with final network. You will get with a probability that it's going to be in one of these classes. So this one, first one, had 87% chance to be chloroplast, and then 12% chance to be, or 1% chance to be mitochondria, and 0.4% chance to be something else. And then you just take the majority here, basically the highest number. So this was chloroplast, this was chloroplast, and this was in mitochondria. And you have some kind of a reliability number here, so basically that is the difference between the sec biggest and the second biggest number and how if that's big you put it to one and if it's small you put it to lower. So you have kind of some kind of number difference there. No, this one was really well, some details about how the chaining was made. Basically you tried Different sizes, you tried a lot of different parameters, you tried a lot of different things. Tried different window sizes, different uh, uh, number of training rounds, different learn rates, so how fast you adjust different things, and number, different number of hidden layers from 0 to 10, and you took the best combination of choosing them. So, this is then at the end how well it performs. So, which is important thing, this is done on a test set, and you see, this is the MCC numbers, they are 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.77. So they're basically for each class there, yeah, um, you know, zero is random, one is perfect. So they're quite good in a way. It's like it's not one, but it's not good. You see, the single petal is the easiest one, the point nine, which kind of you, you could have guessed already in the logos. You know, the logos was much stronger than anything else. And you can also see if you make what's called a confusion matrix, so basically how how many predictions do you do wrong in different ways. You can see, for instance, that there's quite a high number of uh, uh, chloroplasts. Or mitochondrial peptide that appears to be chloroplast, or the, and vice versa. So these numbers are out of um, 300 something, 360 something, mitochondrial pep peptide 40 are classified as, as, as uh, chloroplast. And there are some chloroplasts that are classified as mitochondrial ones. So these are a bit hard to separate. Sinal peptides are slightly better. But there are, some of them are missing from other. So you, and that is actually, actually there is a bit interesting because there are, they exist peptide or, or toy peptides that are a, that are focused on both chloroplast and mitochondria. So these are rather similar by nature because there are some few proteins that should go to both subcellular organizations. And uh, yeah, so in this case you had 85% correct. So this, this is a typical example where you use the combination of what you know about biology you do data mining, you look in the database what you have, and you try to represent it in a good biological way, and then use machine learning to separate these uh, methods. And still, all of these methods is 10 years old, it's among the better ones in this field problem. Just to summarize things, it was this kind of pattern recognition, or uh, 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 important, particularly for de detecting non homologous patterns of sequences, basically things that are not only that are not only by homology, but are uh, similar between a group of proteins, but are but not necessarily evolutionary related. It's like the secondary structure or signal peptides or something like that. You can also be used to find less complex data. There are different machine learning methods. Uh, and the problem is, of course, you, you also have to be careful so you don't do overfit things. So you have to use the training and test set. And you can divide it either by the training and test set or what's called jackknifing and cross validations. 
and there exist a number of different implementations. So one of the favorite ones I used to use is SVM Lite. This is kind of easy to use and quite fast in particular. But there are a lo lot of toolboxes. Vika is one big one. There's R and MATLAB has a lot of toolboxes for doing this, and the MATLAB has a lot of, or Python also, it's something called scikit-learn. So basically everything is now it's quite easy to use. Even this uh, deep learning methods from Google is available. You can, it's called TensorFlow. You can download it and run it. It's um, well, to, run, uh, 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 to run it efficiently, you need, need a good graphic, graphics processor. But, and it's not easy. I don't think you can run it in a cluster yet. You can just run it on one machine. Uh, and there are, but there are, and there are also a lot of other methods. Even hidden market models is a force type machine learning methods, but there are uh, dynamic Bayesian networks, there are a lot of other random forests and stuff that we have used quite a lot late, lately. So it's like a method of uh, forest of mathematical implementation that are basically like rules to say that if you see this, you do that, that you train on. And it's quite computational efficient, so that's how we used it. But in general, in most cases, it doesn't really matter what you use. It's just a question of what this works. Some methods have probably too much memory, and too much memory things like that. But in general, often it's a bit more important how you represent your problem than what is uh, exactly if you use SVM or a neural network or random forest. There are cases where it matters, but in general, it's not so important. Okay. So. Hidden market models are a special case of uh, machine learning. Hidden market models is, in at least in some senses, yeah, is because you train the weights. Then in the way it's used sometimes in biology, I mean, in, in, it's actually if you have an heuristic that puts all the weights directly from scratch, then it's not really machine learning because it's just heuristic. But it, but in the way it's implemented, it's actually it's, it's training weights. Yeah, it's a special case of machine learning. Which is basically basically you give the examples and you train optimize all the parameters in this case to find it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so to do it, we we use it in some other cases also. We don't use really machine learning, but, but in general, yes. And in these cases of machine learning, I mean, does it happen that you have more parameters than observations? And if we have the yes. values that well, oh, it's quite common that you have more parameters because the number of parameters explode. And basically, you solve it by only using the, the test set to eva evaluate it. So the I mean, of course, you can never determine exact numbers. No, if you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't. You don't. You get some random numbers. It's, it's, so you get something that works. It's not. It's, it's not an exact solution. Yeah. So what I mean is that if you have this problem, like if you five, I tell you, uh, the result of five no of the summation of five numbers is this number, and I only give you two solutions. It is impossible that you guess. Which numbers are so because there are infinite solutions? Yes, but I find one that works. So if I have a third set, I, mean, I don't find an interval. I mean, honestly, I don't care which one I find. I find one is enough. So then often you have many more parameters than you have examples. I mean, it really depends. But in this case here, when we had these cases here, we actually have quite a lot of examples. So we had, you see here, we had about a few thousand proteins, but. Uh, uh, so we have a few types of proteins, but we have the input examples is probably is one is zero for the whole data, data sequence. We maybe have you know, 50, amino, 50 amino acids for each peptide, so it's still maybe 50,000, maybe 100,000 positive mm -hmm. examples, and then probably equal number of negative examples, so a few hundred thousand. But if you look at the number of parameters they're used, so we have, say, we have input for parameters, say there are 50 in a sliding window, so yes, that's. I would say, yeah, I would say uh, 20, so 20 times 10, 20 is 400. And even if you only have one hidden layer, or number of, oh, you only have one hidden layer, but say that you have five hidden layers, so you, you have 400 times five, so that's 2,000. And then you have the next layer, which is another. So you have at least a few thousand input variables, and you have maybe, maybe, maybe you have 100,000 input examples. So yes, you have quite a lot in this case. So in this case, you have more input examples. But if you have two input layers, you get it explodes. Mm -hmm. Was someone else a question? So, um, 
Yeah, anyway, I guess think this is the really key thing with the new methods, that this deep learning methods, really, that they, they are much less, I mean, they can handle much bigger, but I mean, they do have more data, and they are, they kind of get rid of it from just so much more data.